Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Research Nexus. I don't know why I call this an episode, but it feels like this is there is a there is a singularity and a and a and continuity in our approach to discussing research at AT Still University. Uh, so today we have our own resident scholars, Dr. Ebony Anderson, and soon to be Dr. Daryl Trailer twice over, Dr. Twice over, we all know. And they are going to talk, uh, talk about uh, qualitative research, give us an in-depth and very, very scholarly overview as to the origins and also walk us through the intricacies of uh, how it differs from quantitative research and how they are actually, they work together as well. So I will, without much ado, I will give it away to Dr. Ebony Anderson and Mr. Daryl Feller. Um, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Dr. Roy. Thank you for inviting us. So before we jump into showing the presentation slides, we put together a poll just as like a pre-test and maybe a post-test post at the end to see or assess your knowledge about qualitative research. I'm gonna throw the poll up there. So if you could all just take the um, quiz, then we will share the results. Give you a few minutes to do that too. Can you see it? Not yet. Okay, let me try that again. All right, can you see it now? Yes, <laughs> technology. We'll give you all about five minutes or so to uh, run through that. The poll is anonymous, so don't be afraid to test. Right. To <laughs> We're not targeting <laughs> anyone today. This is not class. <laughs> All right. On my end, it's showing that the poll has closed and five people have voted. I'm not sure if other people can see the poll. Um, what I'll do, if you're okay with that, Daryl, is share the results so far. We'll, we'll distribute it again towards the end if we have time. Yeah. That's fine, so we can make sure we... Yeah, we wanna make sure we got time for the presentation. We got quite a bit to cover. All right, um, so here are the results so far as far as um, questions regarding qualitative research. Um, we will cover these areas as we get through the presentation. And um, if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to, to ask us. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing that and I'm gonna open up the presentation now. All right, can everybody see that pretty good? Thumbs up? Looks great. Okay, thank you. All right, so again, welcome and thank you for you know, seeing and being with us today. Uh, we wanna to talk about qualitative research. I always make the disclaimer that I am an early researcher and that to be honest with you, I've only been able to truly apply it the way it needed to be applied once. <laughs> But it doesn't at all, you know, make a disclaimer or, or say anything bad about the other research I've conducted, you know, over the last couple of years. So we have a lot to cover today, but I do promise that we'll get through all of it. At least we'll try to. Our learning objectives include contrasting the characteristics of qualitative research with the characteristics of quantitative research, providing a description of five qualitative research approaches. We will also describe the intended outcome of each qualitative approach. We will provide a description of the four different ways that data may be collected in a qualitative study. We'll describe strategies used by qualitative researchers to increase credibility and transferability of their findings. And last but not least, we will critically appraise the collection, analysis, and interpretation of data of qualitative studies. So as you can see in this wordle, or what we call the beautiful cloud of words, there are a few familiar and maybe some unfamiliar terms that make up the intriguing and impactful meaning of research as a whole. According to McLeod and simplypsychology.org, the main difference between quantitative and qualitative research is, and I quote, quantitative data is information about quantities and therefore numbers, and qualitative data is descriptive and regards phenomenon, which can be observed but not measured, such as language. 
So here's a more comprehensive definition of qualitative research, which is illustrated by Nelson et al. But Daryl and I will break down this definition in greater detail throughout this presentation. I'd say the biggest takeaway from this slide is qualitative research involves finding out what people think and how they feel, or at any rate, what they say and think and how they say and they feel, which as we know, could be subjective in nature. And as I previously mentioned, qualitative research involves feelings and impressions rather than numbers, which can make this type of research quite political. Um, in a nutshell, it's shaped by multi multiple ethical and political positions. So qualitative research is a multi-method uh, process, and it involves interpretive naturalistic approaches to that particular subject matter. Qualitative researchers, they study things, specifically people and their thoughts in their natural settings, attempting to make sense of or interpret phenomena in terms of the meanings people bring to them. Qualitative research involves the study, use, and collection of a variety of empirical materials you know, some of these might include case studies or personal experience, uh, personal introspection, life stories, interviews, observational, historical, interactional, and visual text that can describe routine and problematic moments and meanings in an individual's life. It deploys a wide range of interconnected methods, hoping always to get a better fix on the subject matter at hand. The purpose of qualitative research is to describe life experiences and give them meaning. Uh, it seeks participants who understand the study presented to them and those who are willing to express their feelings and experiences. It examines or explains the uniqueness of an individual's lived situations or experiences. And it goes without saying that each person has their own reality. And that reality, again, is subjective. Qualitative research identifies variables for study and review literature to, to build and support that particular argument. It develops theory and or informs theory, and it generates the basic element of analysis, which is based on their own words. Now I'll turn it over to Daryl. Hey, thank you, Ebony. So this isn't an all-inclusive list, but these are some of the more important uh, uh, characterizations of qualitative research. So it's characterized by having multiple realities. So that is, there are different truths. Um, you've probably all heard of the, is the glass half full or half empty? Or if a tree falls in the forest and no one is around, does it make a sound? Um, depending on your intrinsic beliefs, the way that you were raised, political uh, values, religious, spiritual values, different things like that, um, that will help to explain what you view as the truth um, concerning that particular phenomenon. Uh, qualitative research occurs in real world settings, so natural settings. So for example, uh, those of you who work for the university, you know, maybe you are sitting in the back of a classroom observing your students, or maybe you want to go down to the Brazilian jungle to do some work with some of the last remaining tribes of, uh, of indigenous humans in the, in, the, in the Brazilian rainforest, for example. But the point is, uh, these things happen in a natural setting. Another really important point to qualitative research is that researchers and participants are going to have some level of interaction. So whether you're doing a focus group, an ethnography, um, if you're sitting in the back of the classroom, there's gonna be some sort of interaction that you have to take into account uh, in your data. So for example, you're sitting in the back of the classroom observing students, you know, students will turn around and look, they may wonder, well, who is this person, you know, sitting in the back of the classroom? You know, they may spend more time observing you than the actual lecture. And so this, this is something that you would want to take account of, you know, in your field notes uh, and later as you're analyzing your data. Um, and then finally, uh, the results of qual qualitative research are really rich, uh, thick, rich descriptions of that phenomenon. So basically, uh, these are going to be your very detailed accounts and interpretations of, of the situation that you're observing as the researcher. Um, ideally, after you have done your observations, you want to write very detailed narratives or vignettes that are going to explain the situations uh, that you observed and, and, and the context that these situations occurred in. So along with the words and experiences of your participants, that's all going to become the data that you analyze. Next slide, Ebony. So this next slide 
paradigms in qualitative research, it's really important. So basically, uh, your research paradigm is going to guide the scientific discovery process, and that's going to be based on uh, assumptions and principles that are held intrinsic to you. Um, essentially, your research paradigms are going to be your philosophies of science that guide the way that you conduct your science. Um, it's going to be shaped by ontology, so basically how you view reality, your epistemology, so how how the nature how the how the nature of knowledge is conceived, axiology, so that's going to be the role and values of the research process, your methodology, this is how the paradigm defines processes associated with conducting science, and then finally uh, rigor the criteria is, that's used to justify the quality of research in the paradigm. So this is why it's important when you're going into the research endeavor to think about what is your uh, uh, paradigm. So one of the common paradigms in qualitative research is the positivist paradigm. So basically the positive paradigm uh, is going to be based on the assumption that there is one single tangible reality, right? Um, it's one that can be understood, identified, and measured by everybody. It's going to emphasize that human reason is the supreme sort of, uh, of, of defining characteristic and that there's only a single objective truth that can be discovered by science. So the positive paradigm is going to encourage us to, to stress the function of objects in the environment. We're going to celebrate technology and we're going to regard the world as a very rational ordered place uh, that has very clearly defined past, present and future. Next slide, please. Um, so, in contrast, the non-positive paradigm emphasizes that the social reality is going to be viewed and interpreted by the individual, himself or herself, according to their ideology. So again, how you were raised, your political views, spiritual views, the part of the country you're from, um, religion, all these different sort of things are going to influence how you, how you view knowledge what you view as the truth, okay? Um, you're going to question the assumptions of the positive paradigm. Um, the non-positive paradigm argues that society places too much emphasis on science and technology, right? It argues that the ordered rational view of the, of the, of the world, um, the way that consumers exist in the world essentially is not correct. And you're gonna stress the symbolic uh, importance of subjective experience and the non-positive paradigm. And so depending on which one of these views that you subscribe to, that's going to influence the sort of methods and the questions and the different ways that, that you choose to conduct qualitative research. Next slide up. So here we're gonna briefly talk about the history of qualitative research. So in the traditional period, this is from the 1900s, uh, through about the end of World War II. Um, I'll preface this by saying that qualitative research, uh, while a valuable tool, um, it does have its roots in global colonialism. Um, a lot of the early qualitative research from this period uh, was really objective or basically posit uh, positive, positivist uh, views of colonizing accounts of field experiences that were reflective of um, that particular uh, positive scientific, scientific uh, paradigm. So there are a lot of, a lot of uh, for example, ethnographies, for example, that were written about African tribes, Brazilian tribes, tribes in New Guinea. And because these were coming from the positivist scientific paradigm, many of these early qualitative researchers were looking at these individuals, for example, you know, individuals in Nigeria and forming judgments of them based on Western values, Western beliefs, because again, that positivist uh, uh, paradigm says there's really only one objective reality. And of course, at that time, that objective reality was whatever the Western world said that it was. Um, in the traditional period, uh, qualitative research was concerned with offering really valid, reliable, and objective interpretations uh, of the writings of the data. And the subjects who were typically studied were alien, foreign, or strange. So for example, here in the United States, uh, there is a fairly large body of qualitative research that goes along with the Tuskegee studies 
and those individuals, uh, those black individuals who are part of the Tuskegee studies, they were the quote unquote alien, foreign or strange subjects of those qualitative studies. Next slide up. In the modernist phase, so this is the period immediately following World War II going into the 1970s, uh, the way that ethnography was conducted started to change, okay? Um, individuals started to consider important social processes, including social control in the classroom and society. So looking at how society was controlled and how that influenced uh, behavior. Um, researchers were drawn to qualitative research because it, it really started to allow them to give a voice to underserved individuals, or as I said, during this post-war period, the, the modernist phase, the underclass of society. So this was the, 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 the very first beginnings of action research or community-based participatory research as we might call it today. Next slide up. So mm -hmm. in the 70s through about the mid 80s, we started to get this blurring of positivist and post-positivist uh, 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 viewpoints. Um, we had a lot of different paradigms, methods and strategies to use to conduct research. Um, applied qualitative research was definitely gaining uh, status. Um, the research strategies range from grounded theory to case studies, to methodologies, to ethnographies. Um, there were a lot of different methodologies such as the qualitative interviewing, observational studies, personal and documentary methods. Um, computers were becoming very prevalent. So this was important because it allowed individuals to be able to code data much, much more rapidly. Um, the individual who taught my qualitative uh, research class loves to describe how she had mounds and mounds and mounds of note cards with written notes scattered all over the floors, posted to the walls. That's how it was done, I guess, when, uh, when she was going through her PhD at the time. Um, but the boundaries between social sciences and humanities um, and even medicine were starting to become more and more blurry. And so it, it just gave qualitative researchers uh, more venues to practice their craft. Um, social science, and in fact, I would say uh, uh, the hard sciences were borrowing models and theories, methods of analysis from the humanities and vice versa. And ultimately, all of this led to the researcher uh, being acknowledged as being part of the overall research process. Yep. So we come to this point, this crisis of representation. What this means is that uh, we're at this, this point in society now where we're trying to figure out uh, which theories or which, 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 which methodologies should become prominent in uh, qualitative research. So for example, uh, more specifically, um, we're seeing that there's a rise in feminist thought and feminist theory that, that is uh, running through qualitative research. We're seeing post-structural philosophies, um, post-colonial uh, philosophies. So in other words, we're, we're trying to move away from the dominant Western positive, positivist view of qualitative research towards a more non-positivist view. And there's honestly in the, in the, in the qualitative research circles, there are a, there's a lot of pushback uh, in this, okay? Um, one of the big things that you see with qualitative research now in this uh, crisis of a uh, representation during the current day is this whole idea of reflective writing. So this is basically a, a, a practice in which the writer is going to describe a real or an imaginary scene, event, interaction, a passing thought, a memory, um, and they're going to add, that's going to add a personal reflection on the meaning of that phenomenon that the researcher is uh, uh, examining. And so there's a lot of question around this, this idea of reflexive writing. Is this a valid uh, qualitative approach or not? Mm -hmm. Is this scientifically legitimate or not? And so, um, you know, as we move forward into, into uh, this new, uh, uh, new era of qualitative research, these will be some of the questions that, that researchers will have to answer. Next slide. So as I said, in the future, um, we're going to have to work at defining and shaping uh, who gets to, I don't wanna say who, 
or which theories are going to play the dominant role in qualitative research. Um, again, a lot, of the, a lot of the original theories are now beginning to be read um, in more narrative terms as tales of the field. Um, the idea of the researcher as being aloof, i.e. not part of that research process, that's been abandoned. In qualitative research, if you are the researcher, you are part of the research, and that needs to be taken into account uh, in your data analysis. Um, a lot of research now is much more action oriented. Again, this whole idea of community based participatory research, uh, engaging the community around your qualitative studies. Um, qualitative research is now becoming much more concerned with social criticism and social critiques. I expect probably in the next five to 10 years, we're going to see a large body of qualitative research concerning uh, the last four or five years of uh, actually probably the last 12 years of political thought and political history in the United States. Um, so, and finally, the search for grand overarching narratives is being replaced by more local small scale theories that are going to be fit to specific problems and specific situations in qualitative research. So I just say all that to say that qualitative research is undergoing a, a large evolution right now. And it's going to be interesting to see uh, what qualitative research looks like in the next five to 10 years. Next slide. So some of the benefits of qualitative research, depending on the type of study, uh, it can potentially be less costly than quantitative research. Um, qualitative research is a really, really good way to understand uh, the motivations and feelings of people. So for example, uh, my dissertation study, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's initially a quantitative study. I'm examining uh, primary care provider barriers and facilitators to HIV prep prescribing. Uh, we know that in the southern U.S., primary care providers don't do a good job of pres uh, prescribing HIV PrEP. And so the next arm of my uh, research would be a qualitative study where I would dig in to find out why is it that PCPs aren't prescribing HIV PrEP? Is it an issue of HIV stigma? Is it worries about costs? Is it worries about insurance? Is it worries about, you know, HIV counseling and not having the time to do that in the clinic? But the point is qualitative research puts you in a very unique place to understand all of those things uh, with your research participants. Uh, finally, qualitative research can improve the efficiency and effective, effectiveness of quantitative research. So the example that I just gave, in my initial dissertation study is gonna be cross-sectional. It's just gonna be a snap, a snapshot of what's going on at that particular moment in time with the PCPs uh, who participate. But once I start the qualitative arm of the study, then that's going to allow me to have much richer information that I could then use to maybe design an intervention or something, something of that nature. But like everything in life, uh, there's limitations. Qualitative research uh, doesn't distinguish differences in data as well as quantitative research can. Um, with qualitative research, frequently you have to, for example, interview a lot of people to generate, you know, some sort of results and the coding process and qualitative research doesn't allow you to distinguish a lot of differences in that data, for example. Qualitative research isn't always representative of the population of interest to the researcher. So when Ebony talks about her dissertation work, um, she'll talk about her sample and some of the issues that we have with the sample size, but needless to say, um, the sample isn't necessarily completely representative of that population as a whole. And that's something that you have to keep in mind with the qualitative research. And then finally, um, one of the big problems we have with qualitative research is that there is a lot of individuals who claim to be experts in the field of qualitative research. And as you can imagine, that's going to uh, pose some problems when you start thinking about the quality and the rigor of that research and the acceptability um, in terms of publishing that research. Okay, Ebony, is this, is this still my slide up? Yes, you. Okay. okay, so we'll talk about a few approaches to qualitative research. So next slide. So typically before you start a qualitative research project, you want to choose a theory or a methodological uh, point of view that's going to guide the research, 
that's going to help you to then decide on methods. Your methods will help to help you decide on the analysis plan. And it's important to note that in qualitative research, all three of these are interconnected. And if you don't pay enough attention to each, each one of these uh, points of view, um, your, your study is going to suffer as a result. Next slide. So in terms of theoretical approaches, uh, there's deductive approaches. So these approaches are going to seek to use existing theory to shape the approach that you adopt to your, your qualitative research project, um, as well as your data analysis uh, process. Um, again, the deductive uh, uh, approach is going to influence all of the analysis procedures. This whole idea of pattern matching in, in the deductive approach uh, involves predicting a pattern of outcomes based on the theoretical propositions to explain what you're what you expect to find. Um, it's also going to help you with building your explanation. So basically attempting to build an explanation while you're collecting and analyzing the data as opposed to as opposed to testing a predicted explanation as in a pattern matching. Both of these are uh, two types of deductive processes. Next slide. Then there's inductive processes. So the inductive processes are going to allow you to try to build up a theory. So i.e. grounded theory um, that helps you to explain the thing or things that you are interpreting or viewing. So essentially, if you're going to use inductive approach, approaches, uh, you have to be very good at paying attention to your surroundings, i.e. paying attention to uh, your participants. And then you're going to have to get really good at interpreting the things that they say or the things that they do. Um, you're going to have a lot of field text. So basically, you're taking a lot of notes, recordings, uh, pictures, even basically documents from the field that you're going to use to analyze and interpret what's going on in that phenomenon. Um, you're going to essentially take all of that information, you're going to organize it into some framework. Um, that's going to allow you to make sense out of what it is that you're learning, what it is that you're that you're visualizing. Okay, and then finally, when you talk about public text, that's the final tale of the field. So that's basically your written document. So your dissertation, or the article that you submit for publication, or the book that you write, or what have you. Um, the inductive approach is a little bit more. No, it's a lot more involved than the deductive approach, but I think that this is a much richer approach to qualitative research uh, to get data that you're looking for. Next, uh, next slide. So some of the uh, types of qualitative research that are common, and again, not a, not a all-inclusive list, phenomenological approaches, grounded theory, ethnography, exploratory descriptive approaches, historical approaches. Next slide. So in phenomenology, um, I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead <laughs> myself. Um, but basically, the type of qualitative approach that you use is going to be based on your philosophical uh, orientation and assumptions and the outcome that you want to reach. Um, and the type of qualitative approach uh, that you take is often going to be dependent on the research questions and the purpose of your research study. All right, next slide. Now I'm at phenomenology. So phenomenology allows you to provide a really rich description of the lived experiences of individuals. And Ebony will talk more about that uh, with her dissertation um, approach. Um, phenomenology is really uniquely situated for healthcare and health professions education research, okay? Um, the problem with phenomenology and why a lot of people don't like to use it is because there's multiple philosophies that, under, that underlie phenomenology. Um, you really need to have a good understanding of the different philosophies that underlie phenomenology because that's going to determine um, a lot of the methods that you use uh, with this particular qualitative approach. Um, essentially, you're going to have to become very familiar with a lot of different uh, philosophical interpretations of human behavior. And so for me personally, it was amazing for me to sit back and watch Ebony uh, with her dissertation because it was it was based in a phenomenological uh, approach where she had to do a lot of interpretation of the lived experiences of the women in her study. Next slide. 
grounded theory makes a lot more sense to me and my, my orderly way of um, thinking. So basically grounded theory is going to involve the construction of hypotheses and theories uh, through the collecting and analysis of data. Um, it's going to involve the application of inductive reasoning. Um, the methodology, uh, methodology uh, contrasts with the hypothetical deductive uh, model used in traditional scientific research. Um, symbolic interaction theory is basically a frame of reference to better understand how individuals interact with one another or interact with the world to create symbolism in that world. Um, and in return, it helps you to understand how the world around those individuals shape individual behavior. So this is really good for uh, behavioral research. Um, essentially, if you're using a symbolic interaction theory, um, individuals are attaching meaning to the things or actions which form the reality. And again, uh, that is what uh, will help you to develop the theory if you're using this approach. Next slide up. Ethnographies uh, come out of the uh, field of anthropology. Basically, you're exploring cultural phenomena from the point of view, well, you should be exploring uh, cultural phenomenon uh, from the point of view of the subject as opposed to the researcher. As I was saying before, in the 1900s uh, through the end of World War II, a lot of ethnographies were performed or done from the viewpoint of the researcher applying their Western worldview on the culture of the community at study, but that's not how it, how it should be done. And the overall point of the ethnography is basically to understand uh, the culture of, of, of the people under study. Next slide. So in exploratory descriptive designs, um, these are usually field studies that take place in natural settings. Um, you don't have much control over the variables. So for example, weather, or for that matter, whether or not the community at study is even going to accept you, for example. Um, the data that you collect from these type of qualitative approaches, um, they're either gonna contribute to the development of a theory or you're going to be able to use it to explain phenomenon from the perspective of the people who are being studied. Um, but it's not a real specific approach uh, for research beyond just it being a naturalistic form of inquiry um, that you use to study people. Next slide. Historical, uh, this isn't one that I'm real familiar with, but it's, it's, it's interesting. So this particular, go back. Sorry. Yeah, right here. Um, this is a methodological approach that uses a lot of qualitative, different qualitative uh, methodologies to, uh, how would I say, examine history and the way that it influences people. So you think about, for example, the storming of the Capitol, what, three weeks ago. Um, you would examine all of the historical uh, issues that led up to that. And then you're gonna use the outcome of that historical data to try to understand why that influenced those individuals who stormed the Capitol, okay? Um, the, again, this is one that you don't see a lot of or hear a lot of, of, of talk about, but I think it's a really interesting form of qualitative research and one that I would like to actually understand a little better. Next slide. And you are a history buff too, so I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is you, right? This is me, yes. All right. So, so in general terms, the qualitative research process includes formulating an idea or a set of ideas and selecting a topic and problem after reading related literature. It's important to justify the importance of the study. Um, and of course, that is backed up by the literature. And then it's important to create a study design that is going to be part of that process. Identifying and gaining access to prospective study participants is of, of most importance. That is like the heart of the study. And then selective sampling of study participants and data collection is going to be the next step. Um, data analysis comes next. And then finally interpreting those data results. So in the previous slide, I briefly mentioned, very briefly mentioned and explained the entire process of qualitative research, but more in the general terms, of course, depending on your methodology, you may dig deeper into 
uh, how to conduct your research process. But in this particular side, I just want you to look at some of the considerations um, as you conduct qualitative research. And the first is, again, the appropriate selection of study participants or subjects. And then, you know, the relationship between the researcher and study participants is extremely important. And as Daryl mentioned, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, when I conducted my dissertation research. Um, the specific qualitative approaches or methodology that will be used in a data collection process is also something that one must consider. Data management, including the protocols, ethics, and policies, again, very important. You know, that is all tied to the Institutional Review Board or IRB, you know, getting everything approved and making sure that, you know, when you're working with human subjects in particular, that there's no harm or ethical issues involved uh, with working with those particular participants. And then data analysis, which is, you know, the living with the data, clustering and categorizing the data, examining concepts and themes of that data, and defining relationships between or among the concepts. Interpretation of results, which is actually depending on your data collection analysis is, is extremely important. Basically, the more detailed you are in the collection process, which are your thick, rich descriptions, the more accurate your data analysis and interpretation of those results will be. Study participant selection and qualitative research is extremely purposeful and meaningful. Participants are selected who can best inform the research questions as well as enhance understanding of the phenomenon under study. Study participants may volunteer to be a part of the study or be deliberately sought out based on the research area or topic, such as what I did. And the sample size is typically smaller than those who participate in quantitative research studies. For example, Chris Wells stated that in a phenomenological study, it is okay to have a sample size as small as five and up to 25 study participants. Um, you know, I didn't get a chance to research this beforehand, but I know I've heard somewhere through the grapevine that I've uh, had or heard of some researcher conducting a qualitative study with one participant. So you might know about that. I, you know, like I said, I'd heard about it but I never really looked it up. Um, but it is interesting to, to hear, you know, it, that is indeed credible information. So relationship building and building trust is very important in the research or participant selection process. It's extremely dialectic and it does require constant communication, transparency, moral and ethical standards and fairness, you know, when you are in this relationship, this symbiotic relationship, if you will. Um, again, I'll further explain this and I'll go to the next slide, which is, uh, you know, tied to, you know, talking about these things. But actually, I got to turn over to Daryl first. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So uh, our qualitative data is typically going to be uh, subjective. Um, you you're going to observe individuals and then you're going to somehow record that whether that is on a tape recording device taking pictures uh, writing narratives down or what have you um, the data is generally going to be non-numerical in nature um, and again you're, you're you're collecting this data through different different means so observations one-to-one -one interviews focus groups or what have you um, one of the things to note is that you're going to incorporate your perceptions of that of that data. So earlier we said that uh, the researcher is part of the qualitative research process. This is one of the ways that you're part of that 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 process. You're incorporating your perceptions into the data. Next slide, Ebony. So again, some of the some of the ways to generate data come from interviews, focus groups. Um, observing uh, individuals in their natural uh, environment, uh, writing things down, ethnographies. So ethnographies, again, uh, you write things down, you may record individuals using uh, video recording equipment or text recording equipment, taking pictures. And there's also projective techniques uh, that you may use. So projective techniques, these, these are our are, are, are means that you use to tap into participants' motivations and attitudes uh, about a particular phenomenon so that you can gather their perceptions of the phenomenon as well 
as, as your perceptions, and you're going to blend those perceptions together in the analysis of your data. Next slide up. So when you are interpreting the results, um, there's different ways or different means uh, that you can use to interpret the results. Um, the entire goal of interpreting the results, however, is going to be focused on things such as uh, applying the results to potentially a clinical practice. So going back to my dissertation topic, um, I want to figure out why it is that PCPs aren't prescribing HIV PrEP. And so I want to use that information to improve clinical practice, for example. Um, you can use this information to uh, categorize uh, the data somehow or categorize individuals or categorize the phenomenon. You can also use the results to bring unity to the data, particularly if you're doing mixed methods approaches, uh, you, can, you can unify. There's actually a, a method that you can use to unify qualitative and quantitative uh, data into one overarching cohesive uh, set of data. Um, when you interpret the results, um, this is going to help you to recognize relationships between the data. And that's gonna be really important when Ebony describes her, her dissertation research process, uh, but being able to recognize relationships between the data and then developing categories from, that, from those relationships that allow you to do deeper interpretations of the data. And then of course, uh, interpreting the results can help you to develop and test hypotheses to uh, reach conclusions about the data. So there's a lot of different tools that you can use to uh, help with the analysis process. So summaries, so you, you've written up these large uh, pieces of text. Well, you can take that text and then summarize it, right? Your summaries uh, should contain some really key points that uh, emerge from your analysis. You can also use what we call uh, self memos. So these are little notes that you write to yourself about things that emerge from your analysis. Um, they basically allow you to record ideas that occur to you about any aspect of the research or any aspect of the data analysis um, as you think about them. And then finally, uh, keeping a research diary um, as you are maintaining your, your observations. And one of the important points of the research diary that a lot of researchers don't consider is it's important to consider how you feel as you are conducting uh, the research. So one of the things that Ebony will describe in her research was that, uh, and I don't wanna spoil it, but I'll just say that the women in her research told these incredibly gut-wrenching emotional stories and Ebony had to go through a process of writing about how she felt because she didn't want her feelings to ultimately override what it was that the women were telling her. So, so journaling about how she felt allowed her to sort of get that out of her as she was uh, engaged in the process of coding and transcribing her data. She didn't want her thoughts and ideas about their experiences to override ultimately what ended up in her dissertation, if that makes sense. Next slide. So uh, again, qualitative research is a really interactive process. Data collection and data analysis and the development and verification of relationships and conclusions are all interrelated uh, in interactive processes. Um, you are able to recategorize the data to see what themes and patterns and relationships emerge from that data. Um, it allows you as a researcher to recognize, again, those important themes and patterns um, as you're collecting the data. And it allows you to ultimately adjust your future, future data collection approaches to see whether they exist in other cases. So one of the, so qualitative research data analysis, it's just a, this iterative process that is ever changing, ever evolving. Um, you're not always going to use one particular method as you are, are, are analyzing or interpreting your data. Um, and that's what I mean when I say it's a really interactive, ever-changing process. Next slide, Ebony. So in order to maintain rigor in your qualitative process, you wanna be open uh, not only to the researcher, or I'm sorry, the, the open to and, and transparent to 
the individuals that you are studying or the phenomenon that you're studying, but you have to be open to your own emotions, your own thoughts and feelings about this process. Because again, depending on the type of research you're doing, the type of project you're, you're conducting, your thoughts and perceptions may need to become part of that analysis. Um, you need to carefully adhere to the methodology or the philosophy that you've chosen. Um, this idea of data saturation, this is uh, something that Ebony touched on uh, a few minutes ago. Um, in qualitative research, you're going to continue to analyze uh, your data until you get to a point where no more themes are emerging from that data. And that's what's called data saturation. So that data saturation may occur with 17 participants, it may occur with 50 participants, it may occur with 100 participants. Now, as Ebony said, there's some qualitative researchers who feel that literally having one or two participants is acceptable in qualitative research. There's a, a huge debate in qualitative circles about that. I'm not sure how you could reach data saturation with one or two participants, but essentially um, in the classical sense, you want to make sure that you have, have analyzed enough data that no more new themes are emerging from that data then at that point you can say okay i've reached data saturation now i need to go ahead and interpret uh, what this data means um, and then you want to uh, have multiple sources of, of data i.e multiple participants and so again going back to the one or two participants in a qualitative study i'm just not sure that that's adequate next slide up so your qualitative rigor is going to be impacted by all of the following factors. So if you are inconsistent uh, in your methodology or your philosophical underpinnings, underpinnings, if you have a poorly designed study, poorly uh, poor methods, um, if you don't give yourself enough time to actually collect your data. Again, one of the things about qualitative research, and Ebony will touch on this, is that time, it's going to take a lot of time. Some of the interviews that Ebony conducted were four or five hour long interviews. And if you don't have that sort of time at that particular moment, then perhaps you need to hold off on that particular type of project or hold off on that interview because you don't want time to, to uh, influence uh, uh, your, your, your data. Um, again, the poor data collection methods. So for example, you know, if, you're, if you know that you're going to conduct four or five hour long interviews, you need to make sure that you bring a tape recorder with you in addition to paper and pen so that you don't miss things that are being said. And then again, failure to consider multiple sources of data, i.e. not recruiting enough participants for your study. All right, so finally, we come to my presentation slide where I do get a chance to spend a few moments talking about uh, the, the research that I had conducted um, through A.T. Steele University. I think many of you probably know that I did graduate with my doctorate in health education from A.T. Steele University in 2019. So really quickly, I'm going to try to use like a few years of data, a few years of uh, dissertation research and, and summarize in five minutes. So in 2019, I completed my dissertation research titled An Exploration of HIV AIDS and Aging, Understanding the Relationship Between Resilience and Health in Older Adult HIV Positive African American Women Who Live in Urban Areas. Say that three times fast. Um, careful attention was paid to recruiting participants for this study. So um, when I set my intentions on wanting to conduct HIV and aging research, um, I already had in mind the reasons why I wanted to do it. It was definitely personal. Um, just a quick disclosure, uh, my, my father actually was HIV positive. Um, he lived with HIV for about 20 years until he passed away. Um, he didn't die from HIV related complications. He actually died from um, an aneurysm. But that being said, as he was getting older, and, and, and I mean, he was young, uh, 51 is when he passed away, but in his mind, he was an older uh, individual um, who had lost many friends along the way, you know, because he had been diagnosed in the 80s, late 80s, and, and had, you know, went through a lot of trial and error, so to speak, and coming to terms with his HIV status. And then, you know, being someone who was considered a young senior, you know, and, and that's by the CDC's definition, um, anyone who's 50 years of age or older and is living with HIV is considered a young senior. Um, he just didn't really know what, what the rest of the trajectory of his life was supposed to be. 
So he passed away, unfortunately, um, back in 2006. And I always told my father that I would, you know, continue his legacy, his wonderful, rich legacy of educating people about HIV, about speaking about his personal experience of living with HIV. And, um, you know, through those years of collaborating with him and conducting workshops with my father to talk about our family experience of having a father living with HIV, um, I was able to meet and stay in touch with a lot of his colleagues and those who were also in the fight. And so that's where I started. That was the basis for wanting to conduct HIV, AIDS, and aging research. And of course, I considered different types of populations. My dad also self-identified as a gay man. So I looked at the LGBTQ plus community as an option. But I, as I explored further, I realized that, you know, African-American women were kind of at the bottom of that spectrum, if it makes sense. And so I wanted to speak with some of these women um, who were living with HIV for at least five years or more and were over the age of 50 and, you know, were willing to tell the story. So I reached out first and foremost uh, to one of, I call one of the gatekeepers um, in Detroit, Michigan, which is, you know, also where I was born and raised. Um, I reached out to her and I let her know what my mission and goal was. Um, at the heart of it, you know, and I can't lie to you, at first I was very intimidated by uh, this process because I was not sure how well received it would be for someone to come in and conduct research about somebody else's life, but particularly those living with HIV, because we know there's stigma, there's taboo associated with living with HIV, um, even till this day, which is really unfortunate. Long story short, so I reached out and I explained to her uh, this research that I wanted to, to conduct and she was so warm and open to me uh, meeting uh, women from her support group um, who were open and willing you know, to talk about their stories. And um, I intentionally recruited said, said women. So I, I flew back home from Arizona to Michigan, particularly Detroit, and I got a chance to sit in on two of their support groups at two different times, just observation. Um, the very first time I showed up, you know, it was, it was really awesome, gave me goosebumps. They all embraced me and said, you know, we know that you lost your mom recently. Just look at us as if we are all your moms and we'll never be able to replace your mother, but just, just know that that trust is there. You know, the relationship is already established. So, um, that to me, um, you know, let me think and consider the limitations, you know, of the study, but at the same time, I was just so happy to have the buy-in from the very start and, and, and get a chance to interview said, you know, participants. So again, you know, just as a, as a quick overview, the participants included HIV positive African-American women who were 50 years of age and older, living with HIV in an urban environment. Um, these individuals included um, or received, I should say, HIV-related services from social service organizations and clinics in the metro Detroit area. Um, the sampling goal of this research study was to reach saturation, as Daryl talked about. So once those new, new, no, new things emerged in the research, um, my saturation had been reached. In this case, I interviewed a total of 15. I actually had a goal of trying to interview 20 women, but you know, such, it was such a small group. I ended up interviewing 15 but I reach data saturation at seven participants. As far as the compensation, so, you know, we know that, you know, as of lately, this has been very controversial, um, but I decided to incentivize, um, you know, the goal initially was to apply for grant funding to help in this process, but, you know, when you're working full time and you, you know, are trying to get your dissertation done after, you know, being on off, off and on for the last several years, it's like, okay, um, I will just have to uh, incentivize on my own pocket. And I was okay with that. Um, so each of the participants received a $25 uh, MasterCard gift card. And um, along with that, I sent thank you notes. You know, I made sure that I called and stayed in touch with these ladies um, because I didn't jump into actually conducting my audio recorded um, uh, interviews until several months later. So, Keeping a connection was extremely important to me as well. It was definitely a two-way street. 
Um, so in addition to that, you know, I also provided resources. I know that many of them were interested in, and still are interested in writing books, you know, to tell their own stories. Um, you know, some are interested in just getting that word out, whether it be through social media and television, like these women are not shy. <laughs> so um, I was able to provide, you know, some resources, so to speak, you know, if they ever want to publish or if they ever want to speak to a broader audience, which, you know, some were willing to do. And, and that too was part of the incentive. Um, you know, other than that, you know, I use criteria sampling uh, to recruit the study participants and basically, um, and this is quoted by Patton, criteria sampling involves selecting cases that meet some predetermined criteria of importance. So again, they had to be HIV positive, they had to be African American, they had to be 50 years of age or, and older, um, preferably. And if anyone was less than that, then of course they were not included in the study. Um, I use a dig digital video recorder and I transcribed, you know, in verbatim. I stored, coded, and analyzed using an Evo 12 qualitative data software. Um, at one point, I considered doing a uh, mixed methods research um, by providing intervention. However, um, and that would have consisted of using deduce, but I, I did not use deduce. Um, but I just wanted to bring it up. If you ever do want to do a mixed method study, or if you ever have done it. I you know, like to know how it is to software. Um, and then again, for the sake of time, because I see we we're only like three minutes away from two o'clock uh, central time. Um, I just want to talk about, you know, the strong emotions and, and you know, the decompressing I had to do um, after conducting uh, said interviews. They were, you know, very detailed from the very beginning when they first learned of their HIV status all the way up into their quality of life at that given time. And some of these stories were deeply compelling, uh, deeply moving. Um, some resonated with me as far as like when my dad came out and told me and my family that he was living with HIV. So um, after I was done with this entire process, you know, the research process, I had to get counseling myself. And, and I was not shy about that. I mean, I'm a therapist by trade. Um, I have a background in social work and, and uh, counseling. So of course, you know, I'm all for getting the therapy and, and decompressing in the way that you need. And as Daryl said, I, I took a lot of notes, you know, uh, I had a journal where I would summarize my experiences to avoid what we call in the counseling realm counter-transparency or imparting my feelings on them. So long story short, I, I hope that Daryl and I were able to give you a well-rounded view, you know, of, you know, qualitative research. Um, I hope there's something we're able to take away from it. I saw that there were some comments or something in the chat, but I didn't get a chance to see it yet. Here's a list of our uh, references and text. And, um, you know, if needed, we'll send out the presentation if you're interested in having this for your own records. And then here are more references of text. Any questions or comments? Um, thank you. This is Lisa. I just wanted to say thank you, number one, for making this real and making the time to do this for us and for sharing your experience um, so openly. Um, sometimes I think we think about research um, as a purely professional activity, but indeed what drives our passions certainly intertwines um, with our research often. And so I just appreciate your approach in sharing that journey with us. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I know it was a lot to cover. Um, when Daryl and I worked on these slides, I kept thinking, we're not going to get through all of this in an hour. This is like a two-part thing. <laughs> but what do you mean this is a, a semester-long class? True, true. I, I have a question for you. You did a great job of, of your of, with your overview of the different um, methodology, epistemology, all that. Um, I've had conversations with folks about qualitative research and using you know, what you see termed sometimes in the literature as a generic approach. 
So I'm wondering what you guys think about that, how you, and, you, and what you are looking, preparing for today, what your thoughts are on that. Um, so gener the generic approach for starters, I think is a good one. If let's just say, well, I can use my own dissertation research. Mm -hmm. um, all we know is that PCPs aren't prescribing PrEP to African-Americans in the South. Um, 7,000 African-Americans nationwide received a PrEP prescription uh, last year, but there's over 500,000 African-Americans nationwide who have PrEP indications, right? We don't know why that is. And so in order to, for example, not go into the research process with some sort of set or defined idea about what I think the reasons are, you might use more of a generic approach at first to sort of help to start to guide you to a more specific direction. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah, I think a lot of qualitative researchers, Deanne, who I see is in here, and I both had qualitative dissertations and um, have done other qualitative research. And, you know, a lot of times people poo poo this idea that you have, you can do re qualitative research that isn't embedded in phenomenology or embedded in grounded theory. And so she and I have had conversations about this where we're talking about doing a study and well, what kind of is, what is this? And you know, we're like, well, oh, it doesn't really fit here. It doesn't really fit here. Right, right, and right. so, but then the, of course, there's a lot of people who are really invested in this idea that you have to have a theoretical framework as far as, you know, your methodology. And so I was just curious if you had seen anything about this. There's Dan. Oh. Now she now she put on her camera <laughs> to, <laughs> you know to contribute you know. to the discussion. But she and I have had this conversation more than once. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was just curious if on because I agree with you, Daryl, that you know, there are times when maybe it's not important. Right. There's qualitative researchers who would say that's not true. <laughs> That's, and that's interesting too, because um, one of the things that I've, I've, I'm seeing in qualitative research is that many qualitative researchers are really guided by their training. And so the uh, faculty who I've had for my qualitative courses um, are really of that mindset that you need to choose a particular theory or right. orientation, but with a lot of the problems or a lot of the things that I'm looking at currently and want to look at in the future, um, I don't think it would be appropriate to because we don't know really enough about the phenomenon to say, you know, I'm going to choose phenomenology or grounded theory or, or what have you. We just right. don't know. So it I was, was first. Yeah, exactly right. And you know, I, and I can never say this to any of my faculty members. So y'all, y'all <laughs> don't go back and report. It's between <laughs> us. <laughs> yeah, you've just committed to qualitative research. You know, a crime saying. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Any other questions? By the way, sure. thank you both. It was a great job. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I had one. Um, I was really struck by um, your example about the colonial, early colonial um, research and how that qualitative research was viewed. But it, behind the lens of the colonial white um, viewpoint. And you also note that in qualitative research, the researcher becomes part of the research. And so my question is, how do you go into a community and particularly if it's one that's, that's quite different than yourself as a researcher and you know, because there are sometimes you can, your your empathy allows you to be able to see through a different lens, but other times your own lens clouds your ability to see through other people's lenses. And so how do you get past that issue? Um, you know, and that's, that's a good question because now we're moving into an era of more action-oriented research, CBPR, for example, um, a, a big part of that is understanding, well, first of all, having that cultural humility. So understanding what your cultural limitations are 
and then having the courage to be able to say, okay, you know, I'm going to work with the key gatekeepers uh, who can help to grant me access to this community. I think it also requires that you give up some, how would I say, um, give up some of your power and ego as a researcher, right? Because there's definitely power and ego that goes alongside that. You don't, you don't want to be seen as, especially if you're doing action research, you don't want to be seen as the helicopter researcher. We're swooping right. in and then we're going to swoop out and then the, the community is going to be left alone. Um, mm -hmm. It's also important to figure out what is it that that community needs. So maybe, maybe I need to do research on X, but you see that the community needs Y. So is there a way that I can provide the community with what they need while at the same time as getting what I need? In other words, it's about developing real relationships. That's, you know, I always thought of myself as a quantitative researcher, but, you know, as I'm going through my dissertation, I'm finding that qualitative research is really more what I like because it's all about developing genuine relationships with people, or at least that's a part of it, I feel. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you are willing and able to do that, then you can do really good qualitative research. But if you're, if you're not able to do that, no. Then it might not be research. Maybe you need to stick with numbers. <laughs> we all have to know our limitations, right? <laughs> well, you know, this is interesting how the, the timing of this, because our last um, CGH um, research webinar presented a mixed methods approach. And, and her, her statement was, you know, I if I had just gone with a quantitative study, I would not have understood the results. Right. And having gone in with following up with the qualitative research was what enabled her to go, okay, now I get it. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. I'm partial to qualitative research for that reason. You know what I mean? I truly want to understand the results and get into the touchy feely stuff, if it makes sense. I guess that's why they call it a soft science. I'm a softie. Yeah. <laughs> But I'm, I'm challenging myself in ways, stretching myself in ways that I never have. So, um, you know, as we discussed before uh, in the presentation we had uh, with you, Marsha, was, you know, the research we had conducted on COVID-19 and depression resilience and, you know, sending out this massive survey, you know, through social media, um, you know, to get, you know, basically these, these results and try to interpret, you know, data from a quantitative standpoint. And, and thankfully, we have a, ni a nice large group of us, you know, <laughs> uh, to do that because that is not my strength. I'll be the first to own it and admit it. But, um, you know, it, it definitely has been a learning experience and I'm continuing to learn. And, you know, I love formal education. So, you know, if it, if it means I have to go back and take another class or two or three to truly understand it, um, since my job is so re research intensive, then that's what I'll do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you both. This was a um, very good presentation. Thank you. Very useful. thank you. We appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the week. You too. Hopefully you can relax a little bit. <laughs> well, thank you both, both and everybody for uh, joining us today. Uh, the last bit was like reminded me of when it was used to be in class and people used to linger around talking about their own researches anyway hopefully one day we'll we'll get that life back but um i will reach out again uh for the our next um with information about our next re next research uh, nexus in the month of february and it will be an en vivo so very nice segue to ebony's uh utilization of that software in her own research so hopefully you'll get to, you will be able to join us then thank so, you thank you will do do we need to stay on, uh, Dr. Roy, or should we? No, I think we're we're good. Thank okay. you, Dr. Anderson. Okay, cool beans. All right, you take care. Okay, you too. Bye bye. Right. Mm, bye bye.